Welcome to this event at the London School of Economics. My name is Minou Shafiq and I'm the director of LSE and very pleased to welcome you all today. This event is being hosted by the School of Public Policy under LSE's public lecture program and it's also part of a wider program of research called Beverage 2.0, Redefining the Social Contract, which brings together LSE faculty and the wider world to rethink the future of the welfare state. This event also marks the launch of the last of, of the latest issue of the LSE Public Policy Review on reciprocity across the life cycle. The issue is dedicated to the memory of John Hills. Prior to his passing, he was an active contributor to this issue's planning and would, of course, pu have published a paper on reciprocity and the changing role of Social Security in the UK. John was one of the three commissioners on the influential UK Pensions Commission, which reported in 2005, and his wonderful book, Good Times, Bad Times, The Welfare Myth of Them and Us, which was revised in 2017, all of which bore on the question of reciprocity across the life cycle. John's early death in December 2020 robbed readers of what would have been, I'm sure, a deeply enlightening and humane paper, like all of his work, and robbed the authors of the other papers in this issue and the much, much wider LSE community and the wider world of an inspirational colleague and a friend. And we all very much miss him. We have uh, four speakers today and I'm going to introduce them uh, just before they speak uh, and, uh, and then open it up for questions from the audience thereafter. Our first speaker is Nick Baugh, who is Professor of Public Economics at the European Institute here at the LSE. And Nick has written widely on topics relating to the welfare state, including over 130 papers in scholarly journals and edited volumes and over 20 books and is, is really a, a master of this subject. The heart of his work has always been around how market failures can both explain and justify the existence of the welfare state. He served on the editorial board of many journals and has done a great deal of policy work ranging from the World Bank and the IMF to support for and advice to the UK government. And I will turn to Nick to start us off. Oh, and Nick, you're on mute. Nick, you're on mute. Yeah, no, sorted, sorted. Thank you, yes. Um, well, it's, it's good to see everybody. Welcome to this event. Um, just wish we could all be in the same room. And as Minusha said, I very much wish that uh, John Hills could be with us. As Minusha said, he would, of course, have been a leading light in this most recent special, uh, special issue of the, the LSE Public Policy Review. Um, I'm going to follow in John's footsteps and talk about pensions, which involve reciprocity across generations. Um, but the arguments can often get muddled. So I want to spend about five minutes on analysis explaining what matters for good pensions and what doesn't, and five minutes on policy. Now, this, the discussion of pensions often appears complicated because it concentrates on money, on financial flows. Uh, but for many purposes, it's much simpler to focus on the output of goods and services. Pensioners aren't interested in money, which is colored bits of paper with portraits of national heroes on them, um, but in consumption, food and clothing and presents for grandchildren. Um, pensioners can't eat pound note butties. So what matters is output. And the starting point on reciprocity is that goods and services uh, consumed by pensioners have to be produced mainly by younger workers. It's helpful at this stage to simplify the argument by using a simple parable. Three economies. In case one, you've got a single commodity food. It grows on the top of tall trees, which only young people can climb, and it's perishable so that it can't be stored. Uh, in his seminal article, Paul Samuelson used the example of chocolate bars. So the young harvest the food, they share it with the older generation in the hope that they in turn will be supported when they're the older generation. Second case, same island, but you've now got 
two commodities, food and cowrie shells. Today's young people harvest less food for themselves to free time to collect cowrie shells to exchange for food after they've retired. And tomorrow's young accept the cowrie shells as payment um, in order to exchange them for food when they've retired. So that's case two. Case three, again, you've got two commodities, but this time you've got food and ladders. The young people harvest less food for themselves, but crucially, they use the resulting free time to build ladders, a productive asset rather than just a store of value. And when they're old, they let younger workers use the ladders, which makes the workers more productive and allows a larger harvest. And the young share the larger harvest in exchange for the use of the ladders. So in those three cases, what happens when you have population aging? Um, well, with more, so you have the same number of workers, but pensioners live longer. So in case one, you've got the same number of workers, the same production technology, um, and uh, um, an unchanged chocolate harvest. So average consumption has to fall. Workers get less, or pensioners get less, or both get less. Case two, same thing. Output remains the same. Young people have lots of carry shells, which they hope when old, they will be able to exchange. But if you've got a lot of carry shells and not much output, you're gonna get food price inflation. So again, workers or pensioners or both don't get what they expect. In case three, you've got the ladders. So output goes up and if it goes up enough, then average consumption doesn't have to fall and workers and pensioners can get what they promised. So what matters most is national output. And the key difference from case is in case three is that there's investment in productive assets. So that then leads on to the question, okay, if what matters is increased output, how can we do it? And the answer is you've got two ways in principle. You can make each worker more productive by investing in their um, physical capital, robots. You can have higher investment in their human capital, um, in their skills, including that of older workers. So you can make each worker more productive, or you can adopt policies to increase the number of workers from each age cohort. Higher labor force participation, um, higher age of retirement, um, importing labor directly through immigration, or importing labor indirectly by exporting um, labor to countries with a younger population. Um, now, the point to make about pensions in all this is that it's sometimes argued that if you build up large pension funds, that will lead to an increase in output. And there's three responses to that. One is that um, you've got a lot more ways of increasing output. It's not just investment. Secondly, having funded pensions can increase output, but not always or necessarily. And I'm happy to park that uh, for Q&A. And thirdly, um, if the government does want to increase savings, there's many ways of doing it through different pension designs or for things like having a sovereign wealth fund. So bottom line, pensions are important, but not that important. And that brings me to my five or rather four minutes of policy. Um, five big messages. One, keep your eye on the ball. It's output stupid. So it's not the money, it's the output. Secondly, what really matters for growth is having more workers through increased labor force participation and um, the other, you know, immigration and those sorts of policies. Secondly, more and better investment in productive assets, the ladders in my parable. So better physical capital, more and better human capital. And there's many ways to finance that investment. Third, and this is a pension specific message, remember administrative charges. Um, I'm not allowed to give people pensions advice because I'm not a, a registered financial advisor, but I do tell people if they ask me, look at the administrative charges your pension provider imposes. If your pension provider 
charges you 1% of your accumulation each year to manage your accumulation. Over a full career, because of that 1% charge, your accumulation is 20% smaller than it would be without the charge. And when you then think that some pension managers charge more than 1%, 1.5%, you can see why up to one third of what a worker saves never reaches him or her in old age. So that's message three. Um, message four, good government also matters. And Tim Besley's done important work on that. Uh, in many ways, you can argue good government matters more than the way you design pensions. Good, uh, a competent government will run different types of pension plans effectively. Message five, the big mistake. Some people argue that if you introduce large pension accumulations of pension saving, that solves the demographic crisis, that deals with population aging, that's all you've got to do. So they say, bring in funded pensions, and then there's a lot of arm waving about how that will solve the problem. It might well be part of the problem, but it's most certainly not the whole problem. So those are five messages, but I now want to um, move beyond what I talked about in my paper, which is reciprocity um, in the form where the young provide the labor and pensioners provide the capital and move on to, to wider aspects of reciprocity, which Minouche's recent book um, has talked about. Um, first of all, you can make finance more progressive. You could raise the upper earnings limit for national insurance contributions. Uh, you could tax capital gains at the same rate as income. And if you wanted to do things specifically to tip the balance more towards the young, in other words, very much rebalancing reciprocity, um, you could have things like higher child benefit, higher child tax credit. You could have more resources for nursery education. Don't get me started on how important early child development is. The, the evidence is overwhelming. Um, you could have more taxpayer support for investment in the skills of young people, which is a double benefit. You get economic growth and you get more intergenerational fairness. So my two closing lines are, first of all, what matters is output. Secondly, you've got a wide menu of policies in addition to pensions that can be used to balance reciprocity across generations. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Nick, for uh, laying out those issues so clearly. Let me now turn to Tanya Burkhardt, who's the Associate Director of the Center for the Analysis of Social Exclusion, CASE at the LSE, and Deputy Director of Stickard, which is a research center in our economics department. She's also Associate Professor in the Department of Social Policy and Program Director for the BSc in International Social and Public Policy Programs. Uh, Tanya's research interests are in the theories of justice, including the capability approach, measurement of inequality, and applied welfare policy analysis. And she has led several grants from the British Academy, the SRC, the Roundtree, Nuffield, and the Nuffield Foundations, and many others in these areas of research. So, Tanya, over to you. Thanks very much, Manoush. Um, just share my screen. I've got a few uh, slides to share with you. So. I'm talking about uh, welfare within families beyond households. And I think for too long, public policy has treated the family as synonymous with the household. And yet the links within families across generations and indeed across households are strong and in many cases mutually beneficial to the members of the family. The intergenerational family is a major engine of welfare production distribution and redistribution. And I'd like to highlight five key findings from the Dillany Research Programme led by Fiona Steele at the Department of Statistics here at LSE, which has investigated exchanges of practical and financial help between parents and their non-co-resident grown-up children in both directions, uh, using data from nationally representative longitudinal surveys for the UK. So the first key finding is that there's a lot of this going on. Intergenerational exchanges 
are widespread uh, between families. So this question from the UK Household Longitudinal Study, nowadays, do you regularly or frequently do any of the things on this card for your parents? So this is asked of uh, adult children who have non-co-resident parents. And you can see that more than two in five of all adults with uh, non-co-resident parents are saying that they are helping their parents regularly or frequently, including 7% who were giving financial help. And an even higher proportion, nearly three in five of all adults with non-co-resident children are giving help to their children, a flow down the generations, including 28%, more than a quarter, who are giving financial help. You can see in the grade out columns there, we also have data from the other perspective, from the perspective of respondents who are saying about what they're receiving. These are not exactly matched pairs, so the figures are slightly different, but it gives the same overall impression. So there's a lot of this intergenerational exchange going on, but who's benefiting from these exchanges varies. Some families exhibit a high tendency to provide mutual support and others don't. In fact, the chances of receiving help from your parents are about seven times higher, even taking into account of all other differences, seven times higher if you're also giving help to your parents. So that um, mutuality between parents and children is very strong within some families. And that applies to both practical and financial help. And indeed, we find these are complementary rather than substitutes. Giving practical help is positively and significantly associated with giving financial help to parents as well. And moreover, these tendencies within families persist over time. So looking over a 14 year window, we find strong persistence in the tendencies to help. The correlation between giving help to parents now and having given help to parents at a previous point in time, say two to five years previously, is uh, strong and, and positive, 0.68 in terms of a correlation coefficient. And that's a stronger association than we find for any of the other characteristics in, in those, those models. The flip side of this, of course, is that there are also families for whom mutual help is not the norm. Um, and in those families too, the norm of not helping also persists. So third key finding is that the likelihood of providing or indeed receiving help uh, is significantly associated with the geographical distance between uh, parents and children. So on this chart, we can see that offspring who live less than 15 minutes away from their parents in terms of travel time are three times more likely than those who live more than two hours away from their parents to be providing practical help and a similar gradient in relation um, to receiving practical help from their parents. Now we have to note here that this may not be entirely a, a causal association. For example, uh, a lack of emotional closeness, a looser bond could lead both to geographical separation, children feeling happier to move away further, and a lack of, of helping. But nevertheless, this is a very strong association and from other evidence in the programme, we think that it is at least partly causal. And interestingly, we don't see this lack of ability to help in practical terms if you live further away being compensated for by an increase in the likelihood of providing financial help if you live further away. As you can see from this chart, the yellow and orange bars representing the financial help are pretty much flat with respect to distance. So those who live further away are not increasing their financial support um, for their parents or the receipt of financial help from their parents um, to make up for not giving practical as much practical help. Fourth key finding is that these norms of helping are variable across different social and economic groups. So in particular, we find that some of the ethnic minority families are more likely to be giving help than their white counterparts, even when we take account of other differences in their circumstances. So looking first at practical help from parents, 
uh, and financial help from parents, we can see that the Asian and Asian British children are um, less likely than others to be receiving help from their parents of either financial or practical kind. But when we turn to the help provided to parents, so the upwards flow across, through the generations, the Asian and Asian British are particularly likely to be providing uh, help to their parents. So a strong uh, social norm for provision of help to parents amongst that community. But it's also worth noting that for the Black and Black British offspring, they too are very likely to be providing practical help to their parents, and they're the most likely to be providing financial help to their parents. These patterns are consistent with the idea that the giving is flowing from those with more capacity within the family in relative terms to those um, with higher relative needs. Uh, but as I say, it seems likely that there are also social and cultural norms in play here, as well as just the idea of giving to those in need and from those with capacity. Final finding that I wanted to highlight is the fact that upwardly mobile offspring are more likely than their immobile counterparts to be providing financial and or practical help to their parents. So fully half of those who are upwardly mobile are giving practical or financial help to their parents. Uh, whereas downwardly mobile offspring are more likely than their immobile counterparts to be receiving financial or practical help from their parents. So it looks as though these within family transfers are serving to dampen, for example, the impact of downward mobility. Parents are trying to support their offspring who've fallen on hard times. So what does all this mean for implications for policy? Well, first of all, I think we can see that exchanges within families are an important complement to formal welfare. And this is very much consistent with the analysis in Manoush's book as well, I think. Within families, we see that giving is generally by those with greater capacity to those with greater need within the family. But I think it is more apt to describe that as a form of mutuality, perhaps, than reciprocity. There's no evidence here of a sort of conditional giving or an expectation of a return. It seems to be more about the recognition of need uh, within the intergenerational family. Second um, implication is that social policies should, I think, be framed to work with the grain of existing patterns of exchange, including those differences in social norms that we highlighted. But of course, this isn't at all easy to achieve. At the moment, we have very inconsistent treatment of the intergenerational family in different parts of the welfare state. So, for example, tax, tax benefit systems tend to penalise exchanges with wider family beyond the household, whereas adult social care relies heavily on there being that family uh, able to provide care and support beyond the household. The aim, I think, should be to be actively supporting mutual help where it is provided, for example, by exempting modest within family transfers from means, means tests, but also to be offering a minimum guarantee, both in terms of uh, cash and services, for those who don't have access to this form of intergenerational support. Finally, it's important to recognise that public policies that disrupt these family networks, rather than working with the grain of existing exchanges, have high and largely hidden costs. And here I'm thinking, for example, about housing policies that prevent young people from gaining independence whilst remaining geographically near uh, to their parents. Things like benefit caps and local housing allowances uh, that mean that young people face a choice between gaining independence uh, and uh, losing the support of their family by having to move further away. Also regeneration schemes that disperse extended families and disrupt those networks. And indeed more broadly, a lack of regional economic policies and a concentration of the economy in the Southeast of England. Uh, so that it's very difficult often for people to get jobs near where they grew up. Were they able to do so? Uh, they would 
be more likely to benefit from help from their parents in those crucial first years of, of early adulthood and indeed to provide help to their parents later in life, saving the state money in both phases of the life cycle. This isn't a new insight, uh, although it arises from a, from a new angle and a new analysis. Um, we can look back to Young and Wilmot study of family and kinship in East London, which reached the same conclusion back in 1957. Uh, but it seems there are some lessons that we need to learn time and again. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Tanya. Very, very interesting findings. Uh, let's turn now to Tim Besley, who is the School Professor of Economics and Political Science, and also the Sir Arthur Lewis Professor of Development Economics in the Department of Economics at LSE. Uh, Tim is, uh, is one of our most distinguished economists in the UK. He has uh, previously taught at Princeton before the LSE. Uh, and is a fellow of many, many famous societies, the Econometric Society, the British Academy, the European Economic Association. He is the current president of the International Economics Association and previously served as president of the Econometric Society, has been the editor and co-editor of many journals, won awards for being the best economist under the age of 45, uh, and has also played a policy role in many areas, ranging from serving on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, as advisor to the World Bank, to the IMF, uh, and is currently a member of the UK's National Infrastructure Commission and has advised the UK government on a wide range of policy issues. So Tim, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Manoush, and I wish I was still under 45, but sadly no longer. Um, so I, what I'm going to do is, is, is describe to you um, why I think it's important to think about reciprocity um, when we think about the role of the state, the challenges of the state. What I'm going to do is begin with a few kind of high level points and then come to something you know, which really connects, I believe, with debates that we're, we're currently having. Now, just to remind you, I'm, I'm sure you don't need reminding, um, that the 20th century was a truly transformational period in the role of government. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, it was not, it, it would have been thought to, that you would be a high tax country if you raise somewhere between 10 and 15% of GDP in the form of taxation. And indeed, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, um, one of the most celebrated economists of his generation, wrote an article in the early 20th century called The Crisis of the Tax State uh, and how it might even be possible to retain such what he thought were elevated levels of taxation. Now, by the end of the 20th century, that had grown, the role of the state had grown to spend those resources. And it's not, a, uh, it's not uncommon for at least advanced countries to be spending well in excess of 40% of GDP. Um, and, uh, and, and so that transformation is important and, and thinking about why that happened and what its implications are uh, for the kinds of challenges we face, contem contemporary challenges we face, I think is, is important. And I've come to believe that finding a place for the role of, of reciprocity in that story is really very uh, central and, uh, and important. Um, let me begin with the family and, and to some extent, what, what, what uh, Tanya was just saying teased this up rather well, because as she pointed out, if you look across different families, they, they tend to have principles of mutual support. She says, well, it's not exactly reciprocity, but mutuality at least is, is, is key in her findings. But, but what's also striking is the variability. And the same is true when you think about the state. Now, we, we might think or look at the history of Sweden and have seen this transformation from Sweden from being a low tax country at the turn of the 20th century to being a paragon of welfare state provision today, um, but many other countries have simply not made that transformation. And one of the big issues is, is um, when and how can countries do that? And uh, Manoush herself has been involved in a range of policy roles where she's been right at the, the forefront of that development challenge that we, we, all, we all face. Now, I think the story of reciprocity is so important because I think the way to understand these transformational changes is through thinking about the social contract and the way that evolves. And I think the best metaphor for the social contract really comes from human experience accumulated over thousands of years living in small scale societies. 
it comes from experience that our ancestors had in, in, in communities and reliance on families. And if you look in the biological literature, there's even discussion of the possibility that, that there are deeply held uh, instincts that, that are biologically determined for reciprocal behavior. Many animal species have been found to display reciprocity. I think for human societies, we would probably think that cultural and norm-driven changes are the, are the most important. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the two sort of flavors of well, so often people will contrast um, two models of the welfare state. They will talk about the beverage model and the Bismarckian model as the two sort of verge versions that emerged most in history. But what they shared in common, and I think this is important, is, is a belief that um, uh, in, in the notion of, of reciprocity as a norm at the heart of the state. In other words, people would contribute in exchange for more or less defined, and I think the more or less is important, I'll come to that in a minute, defined streams of benefits from that, um, from that contributory uh, behavior. Um, what's interesting is neither was on the left, Bismarck far from being on the left, you could say he was from a sort of semi-feudal German family whose principal motive, as far as I can tell, in trying to build um, the, the first national insurance system in, in Germany was to, 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 to stick it to the socialists. His view is that this was the best bulwark against uh, giving too much uh, potential authority to socialism. Beveridge, too, was not a figure of the left. He was a British liberal um, and similarly drew the conclusion uh, that some kind of reciprocal principles, in his case through national insurance, should lie at the heart of uh, the development of the, of the welfare state. And I think that's key um, in understanding why it is that we, in Britain at least, have broadly reached political consensus on the idea that we do want to tax our citizens, sort of, you know, we debate at what level and in what way, to fund a set of core services. And I would argue the best way to understand that is exactly through the idea that we make contributions to the state. We, of course, we have to pay our taxes, but to a significant extent, we pay our taxes on autopilot because we kind of understand it's the right thing to do. And, and indeed, if you look at the kind of scandals that periodically arise when celebrities or others are even seen to be in, in, engaged in tax avoidance, um, we view that as largely a, a violation of social norms, even if they're not actually breaking the law, because we have quite strongly inbuilt cultural practices which say that you know, we, we comply with our taxes, provided that we have a state that is delivering. And of course, what that means is, is open to debate, what we means to have a state that's effective. Um, there's a kind of narrow interpretation of this that I would aim off, and I think is indeed potentially dangerous, which is to think of this kind of program by program. Um, economists often use the term hypothecation. So what I want to do is you give me a list of all the things that my taxes are paying for. I imagine a world where I could pay a little more of this tax or another tax, and I would get more of some particularly hypothecated outcome associated with that. Um, I think that narrow reciprocity, I mean, does sometimes play as effective political rhetoric. I mean, the example that comes to mind is when Gordon Brown raised uh, national insurance to fund increased uh, spending on the NHS. And of course, more recently, um, the social security, the, the, sorry, the um, uh, social care um, increase in national insurance that was just announced by the, by the government here. The problem with na na narrow reciprocity is it kind of is a tends to be a bit of a lie in the sense that no government can commit to matching the marginal revenue raised by such an arrangement with marginal spending. It's just not a credible commitment because in the end, what we do quite rightly when we look at the public finances is to, is to look in broad terms at what we can raise in revenue and think about our spending priorities and we rebalance as, as seems right in any instance. But it makes for good clearly for very good political rhetoric. And, uh, and in a world where citizens uh, are generally reluctant to wear tax increases, um, no political party has won an election uh, in the last uh, 20 years, I would say, by promising to put up your taxes, even if they're gonna spend more on things that you like. Um, maybe, maybe we have to live with the, the need to 
try and engage in what I'll call narrow reciprocity hypothecation of tax increases for specific ends. But I do think there's a there's a much more important notion of broad reciprocity. You know, in, in Britain, we're particularly unusual about the, 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 the top 1% pay about 30% of the income tax um, that the British government raises. Um, and uh, um, whether you like them on moral grounds, um, you've got to like them in terms of the contribution that, that the rich pay to keeping the British government afloat, because it's a very, very considerable contribution. Although, as my good friend Paul Johnson once reminded me when I made this point, we, we are only able to do it because there's a lot of uh, wealth in that, a uh, lot of income in that top 1%. But even so, the point is that um, we do rely on people um, complying with, 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 with paying uh, taxes. And I think we do it on the basis of, of, of what I would call broad reciprocity, not narrow reciprocity, is that we have states that are broadly trying with somewhat different agendas. And there's some debate about should it be more on this or less on that. But the notion is that we have governments that are in their own way trying to pursue common interest policies that are trying to fund things that we care about, like the health service and pensions and so forth. Now, I'll, I'll end just by connecting um, these rather broad brush points to a couple of uh, na narrow points, which I think are big questions that come out of this for some policy challenges that we, we face. Um, I think, I, I mean, one's gonna sound rather arcane, but I do think it gets to the issue. And that's the, the whole debate about putting up national insurance versus putting up income tax. Now I have a bit of form, which I've, I, I've sort of recanted my view. I was part of something that the IFS did about 15 years ago, uh, 10 years ago, called the Murley's Review, where we one of our recommendations was the merger of national insurance and income tax, which is a commonly held position among economists. That if you look at the complexity we have in our system by having the two taxes, it's really quite considerable. And it would be, if you view it as a problem of taxation, it's pretty hard to believe you would design a system that looked anything like the one that we, we have if you started from scratch. But I kind of have come to aim off that view, partly because of the kinds of issues I've already been talking about. Um, that, that national insurance, the notion of national insurance, which goes back to beverage and Bismarck and all of the issues I'm talking about, is as a kind of form of um, state citizen reciprocity, that there are certain things, certain programs that uh, I believe I can benefit from and are in a certain sense, in a broad sense, not the narrow hypothecation sense, but in a broader sense, funded through a contributory uh, system. And we've little by little since beverage um, dismantled most elements of reciprocity. Um, we don't really have a, a, um, an unemployment insurance system to speak of, whereas many other countries have maintained some kind of closer link between contributions and benefits in the area of unemployment insurance. Um, the furlough scheme, which we passed uh, what, what a little more than a year ago now is a case in point, that there was a notion that that should be capped, very credible argument that, that there should be a cap on the amount of money that someone could claim in the furlough scheme, um, regardless of say any past contributory behavior. So we've really quite in a, in a rather wholesale way rejected the idea of connectivity between contributions and, and, and benefits. And to the extent we want to have that, the national insurance as a vehicle is the right way to do that. And I think as the debate about um, social care unfolds, um, I, I do think that's um, something that, that will, will come up again. Um, um, the other area is the area of pensions. Um, we, we again have increasingly moved to a system where pensions are thought of as part of a means tested system. Um, those of you who are old enough on the call will recall that there used to become something called the state's uh, earnings related pension, which was an explicit attempt to allow people to contribute more to the state in exchange for higher levels of, uh, of benefits. And, um, and indeed, the, the, what are viewed now to be very generous levels of deductibility of pension contributions are fast being wound back by the state. But if I'm right, and we need to view these things through a kind of reciprocity lens, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that, that a corollary of that is allowing people further up the, um, uh, up the um, uh, income distribution to be able to get through the state uh, a link between what they contribute and what, what they get. And I would argue the, the main historical lesson from the last 
150 years is it's been a very powerful way of building effective states to make them participatory across a wide range. And, um, you know, let me leave you with an example. Um, my, my, my son is much poorer than I am. It makes no sense at all for him to buy me a birthday present on the basis that, you know, he, I've got far more money than him and anything he could buy, I could buy for myself. But it's an absurd notion uh, and, and I think a neglect of basic human relations <laughs> to think that we don't encourage gift giving, reciprocity, basic human instincts. And we should do so in the way we build the state, just as we do it in our personal and social relations, because these are deeply ingrained human values. And if we start to think of the state as them and us, which John Hills rightly told us was the wrong way to think about the state, um, then I think we get into quite dangerous territory. And we do need to remember how we're rooted in our human relations very much in the notion of reciprocity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Very thought provoking. Uh, and finally, we will now hear from uh, from Greg McClemont. And uh, we were very keen when we organized this event to have someone who could really draw out the policy perspectives and consequences, and maybe even a little bit around the politics of this for us. Uh, Greg was UK Shadow Minister of State for Pensions between 2011 and 2015, and was a member of the Prime Minister's 2014 Further Devolution to Scotland Commission. He was MP for Cumbernauld from 2010 to 2015, and before entering politics, he was a fellow at St. Hugh's College, Oxford, and trained as a historian, where he also uh, taught at the universities of Glasgow, Pennsylvania, and Oxford. He's currently a visiting fellow at Nuffield. Greg, enlighten us about politics and policy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I, I, I'll do my best, Manoush. Uh, firstly, thank you for the invitation. It, it, as, a, as a social democrat, as a, as a former Labour uh, politician, and with a, a, a background in 20th century British history, John Hills was you know, a really important figure and certainly the evolution of, of my thinking such as it has been about what would make an effective UK social democratic uh, nation and I guess it's probably as well to put one's cards on the table insofar as reading these fascinating and rich papers I guess I approach them from that mixture of perspectives as someone interested in seeing a, a social democratic United Kingdom however we describe that um, and the evidence base and all the difficulties and trade-offs that emerge in that process. And of course, in 10 minutes, doing justice to these three papers is, is almost impossible. So in that sense, probably my comments might appear a little bit scattered gun, uh, but let's proceed nonetheless. Um, taking uh, Tim's fascinating paper, you're going in reverse order. Really, one thing that struck me in reading the paper and, and listening uh, to the way Tim articulated it. If one thinks about the conservative side of politics, I remember when George Osborne was chancellor, he was very keen and I think put through um, a, a piece of legislation that when you get your, your, you know, your income tax statement, with your, it explains what your taxes are going to. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not sure many people look at that very closely and I have to say, I can't summon it in my own mind in terms of uh, actually having looked at it myself or indeed the details as Osborne put them through. But certainly it was something that he proposed and, and delivered. And that, of course, speaks to one side of the equation, mm -hmm. the side of the equation which is demonstrating, you know, a, a linkage between what you pay and, um, you know, the, 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 the system that's taking that taxation. But, of course, we're interested in something much broader. When Tim mentioned Sweden as a, as a sort of, you know, the, the exemplar of, of a social democratic state and in some ways how unusual that's been, one thing that struck me thinking about it through the prism of the new Labour years and reflections on the new Labour attempts to build um, a more social democratic UK was the challenge of understanding the importance of institutions that transfers in themselves didn't, you know, nurture um, that, that reciprocity, if one wants to call it that, that ethos, that culture, you don't leave behind a, you know, a, a legacy, which of course can thrive, thrive in its own terms. And I think that's something in reflection that, that many of the, the architects of New Labour felt quite strongly. And actually, if one takes it back 
um, further to the Attlee governments in their aftermath, very powerfully in, in the Fabian essays reflecting on the Attlee government uh, after 51, there was a real strong sense, I would say, the, the animating um, sense that Labour had failed to, to create a, a citizenry who actually would live um, the ideals in which the, the, the welfare state had been based post-1945. And of course, there's a very deep division on the social democratic left between, I think Peter Clark called it most famously, moral and mechanical reform. And in almost everything I was involved in as a politician in terms of policy development, that moral versus mechanical, you know, can one change the structures and that does the job? And um, on the other end of the spectrum extreme, you actually have to change people. Of course, it's a divide that runs through uh, social democratic history. And of course, and I think Tim alluded to this, um, I would certainly think of the left as including uh, the liberal tradition. Uh, ben Jackson's uh, book on progressive political thought, very strong in drawing out that really one has to put most of the Labour thinkers and Hobhouse and Hobson uh, out br in broadly the same category. So no disagreement there. On the practicalities, and I'll be quick so I don't have to look at the other two papers very quickly, um, I thought Tim's focus on, on, on that ethos very important and social insurance. I was really struck um, by his focus on a, a, a social insurance system where there's you know there's something in it for for higher earners, um, income protection and, and the loss of employment. Um, maybe finally in that point, I say rather scattergun, striking in the German social democratic context, how much weight is put on the Schroeder reforms is destroying uh, the basis of social democratic support in Germany. I'm sure it's much more complicated than that, but certainly Agenda 2010, with that real check away at that German approach of income protection all the way up the scale, um, seen as very important in eroding the, the basis of German social democracy, even if there was a, you know, a glimmer of light the other night. So very scattergun, uh, given the, the context, but just some food for thought. Uh, moving on to, to Tanya's paper, um, the way I, I was reading it summed it up was, and I have a, a Greek wife, so that probably um, contributes to this, that the, the picture of the, the Southern Mediterranean um, intergenerational family all living under the one roof has somewhat misled policymakers to the reality of the UK intergenerational um, family support, because of course it's not necessarily and usually under one roof. And I think it raises some really challenging questions for, for policy development. I, my main instinct reading the paper was to wonder about the capacity of the British state to make these more finely tuned um, judgments and translate them into policy. Um, when I think about the, the, the Department of Work and Pensions in particular, um, I, I think that it, it's a real challenge um, you know, to, to deliver that um, cohesive but also tailored approach, um, which Tanya's paper and her contributors, colleagues, brings out uh, very, you know, very, very strongly. And, and one historical point, I was really struck by the, the reference to, to Wilmot and Young. There's a recent book by John Lawrence, a, a very distinguished 20th century historian, which critiques the evidence base of, of the Wilmot Young study, argues that a lot of the arguments were a priori and that the evidence that was collected actually demonstrated that kinship networks weren't as strong in the east of London and Bethnal Green as, you know, as their, their evidence purported to demonstrate. I suspect it wouldn't change substantially you know, any of these contemporary um, policy dimensions that Tanya and, and colleagues bring out so well, but I thought it was interesting as I was reading it uh, to reflect on, on that, that latest kind of critique of, of Wilmot and Young. And again, being almost under 45, striking that the way uh, Tanya and her colleagues' papers challenges what developed certainly in the 2000s, the kind of friends phenomenon, you know, of the, of the, of the American sitcom where friends rather than family were seen as increasingly becoming central to, uh, I lose track of the generations by alphabet, but Generation X, Generation Z, you know, the, there, was, there was a decrease of family ties striking to see that challenged um, in, in Tanya's and colleagues' excellent papers. And then finally, pensions, which uh, my old stamping ground, what can you say about, about Nick's wonderful paper? Firstly, very few 
very few politicians understand the intergenerational nature of pensions, certainly on the basis that, that, that Nick brings it out so, so lucidly. Um, the, you see it in the, in the debates about the state pension, where the state pension is seen, you know, whether it's going up or going down, that's seen as a problem for pensioners full stop, rather than future recipients of the state pension. And that's just embedded into political debate, I, su debate, I suggest, because, and this probably um, goes to all three papers and the challenge of turning them at a policy-making level, a politician level, you know, into, into policy, the difficulty of thinking long-term. You know, politicians, it seems to me, ever more of a challenge in thinking long-term. Um, and I thought of that, you know, brought it out as I was listening to, to Nick's wonderful paper. Absolutely agree in governance. And Nick had in his paper around pension freedoms and the extraordinary tension, shall we say politely, between an approach on, on accumulation, which says we understand behavioral economics and you've got to make it as simple as possible and as few choices. And then the nasty's hardest problem in finance, um, as it's famously described, um, of decumulation, the policy logic <laughs> lies, if we can call it that, in the direction of people uh, understanding themselves as actuaries as well as investment professionals. Um, so that good governance really brought it strongly to me. And of course, the, the output point, it, it brings pensions back into a broader political debate. And I'll finish on this point. Very difficult to get politicians to understand the importance of pensions beyond the state pension often. Nick's paper offers actually a way to potentially do that by grounding pensions much more clearly in a straightforward way in the broader economy. And actually, it's got me quite energised about uh, the, the possibility of getting politicians to pick up more on how it's, it's rooted in, in, in the real economy. And I think that's a very, very... Uh, important contribution. So I, I suspect I've run over time. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you so much. I, I, you know, it just strikes me that s s one theme that cuts across all these papers is kind of, you know, where do the costs of social insurance lie? And is it the family? You know, some of it lies with the family. Some of it is social insurance. You pay in, you get benefits. It's contractual in that sense of uh, how you describe George Osborne's, um, you know, showing people where the taxes went and local councils also do that. You know, they break down your council tax, how much goes to rubbish collection, how much goes to community activities and so on, versus the more, uh, you know, what Tim was referring to is sort of more universal entitlements, reciprocity with a large element of redistribution in it because all of this is fungible. And so much of the debate at the moment is what benefits should sit where and who should pay them. I mean, I was just curious with Tanya on your paper, you know, you said policy should go with the grain of these inter-family transfers. And, um, and there have been some people who've argued maybe we should pay people to care for their aging parents, for example, rather than put them in institutionalized setting. And yet would doing that monetization of that relationship actually go against the grain and you know where should policy sit in that kind of question I'd just be curious is that as a question for you and for, for, for Tim also just a question around um, you know you mentioned the debate about whether the Murley's argument about should we merge income tax with national insurance and you've kind of stepped away from that but if you were if you were having if you had a clean slate would you think about it differently in the sense that some some parts of the welfare state do have an insurance quality and probably should be in a kind of insurance funding framework whereas other bits which are much more redistributive probably should be funded from income tax and if you had a clean slate what what would you fund through which channel? Uh, or do you in the end think it's all fungible and this is all, we should just accept that it's fungible and do it university. But I don't know, Tanya, Tim, did you have any reaction to that? And Nick, I'll give you a chance and then I'll turn. We've got lots of questions coming in from the audience and maybe Nick can respond a bit also to the issues that Greg raised. Tanya, why don't you start? Oh, thanks, Manoush. Well, Dan, thanks also to Greg for your very, very interesting uh, thoughts and, and reactions. Just to pick up on, on your question, Manoush, about um, whether monetization might go against the grain of, of caring 
relationships. I think that's an interesting point. I think my reaction is that we need to ask the people who are doing the caring what they actually want. And in, in the many cases, what they want is services, support to make their caring role a bit less burdensome. So they want maybe respite services so that they can have a break. They want their own health and mental health needs to be attended to. Um, they want to be recognised for the work that they're doing and, and for that to be given its proper social value. Um, for sure, there are financial hardships as well. And I think Carers UK has got a survey out that suggests that particularly during the pandemic, um, the financial consequences for carers have been very severe indeed. Unpaid carers has been very severe indeed. So there's certainly a, a, a financial aspect to it, but it's by no means reducible simply to, to the uh, to, to, to cash. Um, so I think I think that's a, 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 it's a very interesting area um, about exactly where that where that balance should should lie. Um, and yes, Greg, I, I completely agree that the characterization of, of the southern European welfare states as familial welfare states are based on the family rather than based on um, state reciprocity or, or, or provision through uh, formal means. Um, and the UK, for example, is not a familiar welfare state, is, is a very, very misleading characterization. First of all, of course, there's a lot more formal welfare in the Southern European welfare states than we perhaps like to, to think about, or care to remember. And, and also there's just much more happening, much more of activity uh, and, and effective support going on through the family in the UK. Um, so trying to, to reflect that, I think, is crucial. You're right that our systems are not good at being fine-tuned to differences in people's need. I think, again, coming back to something that, that Manoush brings out in her book on the social contract, the idea that there needs to be a guaranteed minimum, both, both in terms of uh, standards of living and in terms of the service offer, basic services, um, is an important flaw, then, for this variation to then exist um, so that the state may not need to be tracking each and every twist and turn in uh, somebody's family support because there is that um, secure minimum in place for them. Just check, Tim, did you want to come in and then Nick? Can you yeah, just, just, just briefly on, on answering your, your question. The answer is I don't have a firmly worked out plan for what the bounds would be, but I think in principle, the idea of there being various um, things that we, 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 rights that we accumulated through, accumulate through the state that have a contractual element would be those components that I would argue there's a prima facie case for funding through something like a contributory national insurance arrangement. So it would be unemployment insurance, it would be pensions, it would be social care, I think. Things where we can make a kind of clear link between uh, um, earnings histories and the kind of benefits you would receive, but it would never make sense for roads or bridges. Indeed, I think it'd be deeply dangerous if we got into a yeah. debate saying, I only have a decent bridge in my street because I pay a more or less taxation. I, so I, so I, I do think it would have to be carefully articulated. While I have the floor, I have a question for, for, for Greg coming out of something he said about new labor and, and the conversations that were taking place there. I've been very, I mean, I think the, British conundrum, and, and it became very clear during the New Labour years, but it's been true across a range of different governments, including the, those that have been in power since 2010, is this whole business of trying to uh, pretend that we can have um, Scandinavian public services and uh, American levels of taxation in a mm. nutshell. And first of all, does he disagree with that characterization? Of course, that's a very stark way of putting it. But, but also, what, what is the right way to go about trying to untangle that? Because we do end up with these kind of patchwork reforms where we sort of hope we can pull a fast one on the electorate by introducing some kind of taxation because we, we lack some kind of um, element of public spending that would be valuable. Is there a way out of that politically? Or if we just got to accept that that's going to be the kind of um, fixed point that, that we all have to react to as a, to as a, as a constraint. A, a great question. So just to say on, on the new labour point specifically, I, I remember Andrew Dillnott once um, explaining to me how 1992 was just the dominant 
um, psychological memory of the architects of new labor, that 1992 general election in which John Smith, if we remember, you know, went in with a, a clear costed program of tax rises on the better off and was very much seen to have cost labor the election, whether that was true or not, that that structured certainly the architects of new labor's view of, of the politics of tax and spend. And then of course with Gordon Brown, a genuine social democrat, then trying to, um, you know, to, to invert the commas, solve that problem by lots of taxes that weren't noticeable to the public. That was, if we remember, that was the approach. O on the heart, you know, the, the, the really tough question of, of the future, um, is it is that the, the 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 game with both sides understanding that you you have to you know operate on that basis of promising one while recognizing that the, the tax doesn't support that? I guess you could see the Labour manifesto in 2017 is is different, of course, in 2019. Um, you know, as representing it's 2017 manifesto when Labour did much better than it expected, really a 1970s social democratic manifesto. Um, and that certainly had a lot more uh, distribu distribution, redistribution uh, in there. Uh, but generally, it, it does seem to be the state of the game. Tim, you see it in Scotland, finally. I mean, the, 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 the independence movement in Scotland is, is very much based on that, that approach, that Scotland is Scandinavia, but with no commitment to, to <laughs> taxing other than in the, on the UK model. So uh, it, it seems to exist across the across the whole island. So I'm probably not too optimistic about, about taking that on. Yeah. Nick, did you want to add something? Yeah, a few words, thank you. Uh, Greg, good to see you and thank you for your comments. Um, if I could pick up on, you know, should you pay people to care for their parents? You, you've sort of got a tension. On the one hand, Titmus, the gift relationship, if you monetize it, you kill the reciprocity. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have genuine need. Mm -hmm. and. I think Germany, as I understand it, has a good solution, which is their social insurance contribution to cover social care includes an element to cover domiciliary care, which you can use to buy in care or to pay for informal care. But the rate at which it pays is not market rates. It's much more. So it's more than a token, but less than market rates. And maybe there's some compromise there. Um, on, on your question about, you know, national insurance for insurance and other bits are redistributive. Uh, let me get back to my traditional hobby horse, which is going back to the <laughs> going back to the core objectives. Yeah. And government should ensure that people have access to poverty relief, insurance and consumption smoothing. Now, poverty relief clearly is redistributive and only government can do it. Insurance depends some insurance, automobile insurance, burglary insurance, private markets work perfectly well. Others like unemployment, et cetera, for well-known market failure, failures, they don't. Therefore, that has to be a state activity. Consumption smoothing, which means better off people, the point that's been raised. Um, again, it's a technical question. Can the private market do it? Answer in pensions, yes, to some extent, but it needs heavy regulation. Uh, and some, you know, a public-private partnership. So the answer is you have tax-financed mechanisms like universal credit. You have contributions-related elements that I think of as being insurance. And I think long-term care is preeminently insurance because um, it's something that may happen to us in old age or may not, and you want to pool the risk. So those things, I think, the government should be doing and um, consumption smoothing one needs to be thoughtful and understand the analysis as well as the politics not just go for the politically expedient and finally just sort of Greg's point about um, the need for thinking long term I mean this is the difficult bit you know good government is capable of thinking long term Sweden manages its pension system with a mechanism for long term so does Canada um, but it seems to be the besetting problem of politics in this country that sort of an adversarial political culture makes that sort of cross-party long-term thinking very difficult. Yes. I remember when saying to a senior government official that we, we were doing a strategy for the LSE to 2030, 
And he said, oh, that's interesting. When we say 20.30, we mean 8.30 p.m. <laughs> okay, let me turn to the audience questions now. Uh, the first one is from Michael Joffe, who's an LSE alum who's now at Imperial College. And it's a question for Nick. Um, what about accumulated wealth? for example, housing, and how do you deal with that? I think you're on mute still. Housing is a special case because um, you can store housing. But imagine what I call the squirrels model, that people each year set aside 10% of what they produce and they stick it in a storeroom. So tins of baked beans, bottles of paracetamol, et cetera. And that's to finance themselves in old age. Three problems. Problem one, it's expensive. Um, you're giving up the returns you could make on saving in financial assets. Uh, problem two, um, things go out of date. You store an analog television. Um, problem three, uncertainty. You don't know who you're going to be in old age. You know, your, your tastes may have changed. Um, your medical condition may stop you drinking the fine wines you've, um, you've stored. And finally, the key problem is services. You know, I can store in principle a physical asset, but I can't store a young doctor to look after me in old age. So you've got a problem with services. Now, the one big exception are long lasting consumer durables. And I agree that you can um, store housing services by becoming an owner occupier. But I would say that's a specific example. And I agree it's relevant to current policy uh, discussions, um, but it's not an answer to um, population aging. Great, thank you. Next one is for Tanya from Polina Obolenskaya at uh, LSE in case. And she asks, uh, does the research you talked about explore help and receipt of help among other members of the family, such as siblings, aunts and uncles, et cetera, or is it just parents and children? Thanks very much. A great question, Polina. Uh, no, unfortunately our data only allows us to look um, vertically between parents and children across the generations that way. Uh, but there is other research, not, not as much as there is uh, looking across generations, that has looked at other relationships, particularly sibling relationships, um, and how significant they can be. Um, and that's very interesting in two respects. Firstly, it very much reinforces the importance of different social and cultural norms. So as you probably know, there are some communities in which everybody's an auntie. Um, so that the, the definition of what counts as kin is very wide indeed. Um, and there are indeed expectations of uh, mutual support uh, when people fall in hard times from that, from that much wider network. And in other communities that, that doesn't exist. The other thing to say on, on uh, that is that, of course, one of the demographic shifts that we're going through, continue to go through is uh, smaller numbers of smaller family sizes. Uh, so what's sometimes called the beanpole family, that the, the generations are stretched out and there are fewer children. And that, of course, reduces the number of siblings. It reduces the numbers of, of aunts and uncles around. Um, so thinking through what are the implications for the reduction in that wider kin network going forward and the, the again, shifts between families and state in terms of who's going to be providing the care and support in these informal and, and ongoing ways is, is a really important, really important issue. Okay. The next one I've got is for Nick. It's from Dev Diotti, who's the un undergraduate uh, student of economics at the University of Delhi, who says, can the goals of increased worker participation and increased expenditure on capital goods be contradictory, particularly in situations of jobless growth where output expands owing to more efficient machinery without a corresponding increase in employment opportunities? Well, hi there, and thank you, that, thank you for that good question. Um, the old argument used to be if you had 10 workers each with a shovel and then someone brought in a mechanical digger, they would be out of work, but you ended up with 10 workers in 10 mechanical diggers and productivity goes up. So the, the old argument is capital innovation raises labor productivity. Um, the question is whether that still holds today and this is controversial. 
to what extent are we all going to be out of work because of robots? Um, that's why I didn't just talk about investment in physical capital, but investment in human capital, in people's skills. It seems to me if all you do is build better kit, then you're going to get more unemployment. But you need to upskill people. And that's where I think one can get a balance between up to a point having one's cake and eat it. Okay, very good. Uh, next one is uh, for Greg, uh, and it's from Mike Otsuka, who's an LSU professor of philosophy. And he asks, public sector pay-as-you-go pensions in the UK are currently discounted at G, long, the long-term rate of growth in the economy. Does the question of whether it makes more sense for these and other pensions to be funded rather than pay-as-you-go mainly come down to the question of whether R, the rate of return on capital, is greater than G. As Tom, Thomas Piketty claims, it's normally the case that the rate of return is greater than the growth rate. Um, and Nick, I'm sure you may also have a view on this, on this question. Yeah, I saw, I saw Michael's uh, question uh, on, the, on the chat, and my first thought was, please give that to Nick. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, do I, that I, for a team. I, I will. I will have a. I will have a bash, which will not be an economist bash. But um, one thing that strikes me, and this goes to next paper, um, there, there, there appear to be parts of of um, the broad investment universe where you can get very high returns. Um, parts of the market, you know, which are hard to access, that you need specialist skills, a lot of capital. And to the extent that pension funds, for example, are able to access those asset classes, and this, of course, is a key thing that was in the next paper, at a reasonable cost, which doesn't eat up all the returns, mm -hmm. um, I guess that's where rate of capital becomes difficult, because is it measured after all intermediation has, um, you know, has been taken out of, the, out of the calculation? I'd probably go back to the next paper and that, and that point around... Um, the output is straightforwardly the, the, the key aspect. Um, and on a pay-as-you-go basis, of course, growth rate of the economy is probably easier to measure in the round, and maybe this is where I'm off my chosen turf, than rate of capital, which I suspect is pretty complex to, to calculate and aggregate in a way which makes sense across the, the pension fund universe. Nick, did you want to add something? I was going to say, this is the trouble with co-editing with Mike. He asks horrendously difficult questions. Um, I've got no pat answer, but I just want to bring out a related point, which is you've got two separate situations. One is a world of steady state, you know, a world in which we've always had pay-as-you-go pensions or a parallel world where we've always had funded pensions. And there the arguments of R and G apply. But that's not the essay question typically. The essay question is typically, we've got a pay-as-you-go system, we want to increase funding. And that's not a steady state discussion about R and G, it's about a movement from one steady state to the other. And that's got um, efficiency effects. It's also got redistributive effects across cohorts. So, I mean, I think my bottom line is the, the R and G argument applies for a steady state comparison. I'm not convinced that it does to the practical problems that um, that sort of we're grappling with in the public in, in this issue of the public policy review. Yeah, it's interesting because there's an exactly parallel debate on R and G in when you look at government debt sustainability. Yeah, yeah. exactly the same set of questions and um, yeah. Okay, all right, let me move on. Next one uh, is another pensions one from Charles Sherwood, who's an LSE PhD student for Nick. Uh, can you expand on the significance of funded versus unfunded pension schemes? You've kind of mentioned a little bit of that already. Well, I mean, I guess my bottom line is to say, people who say we're doomed, we're doomed, panic, panic, unless we have funded pensions are missing the point that what matters as in the parable, is output growth and investment in human and physical capital is part of that. And saving via individual pension accounts is one way of doing that that can work and often does work. But you can save through pensions, not through individual accounts, but through other ways. I mean, Canada has got 
a national pension plan, which is about 25% funded. Um, the Netherlands has got fully funded industry plans, so you don't have to do it at an individual basis. Or you can have increased saving outside the pension system, like Norway's sovereign um, wealth fund. So my argument is funded pensions are worth studying, but one shouldn't overestimate their importance. And then in the paper, and you know, I won't go through this now because time is short, but you, you have to ask different questions. One, does funded pensions lead to an increase in saving? And the answer is it can, but not necessarily. If workers' mandatory pension saving is offset by a decline in other saving, you may not get an increase in saving. Secondly, does the saving lead to an increase in investment? Answer, yes, it can, and often it does. But um, the miners' union in the 1980s famously invested in old masters' paintings. So mm -hmm. this was cowrie shells, not ladders. So it doesn't necessarily do that. And finally, if you do get increased investment, will that increase economic growth? And the answer is yes, if it's productive investment, but no, it's investment in the latter years of communism where it was all highly inefficient. So bottom line, it matters, but it shouldn't be overstated. Right. Very good. I'm gonna give this last question to Tim and then I'm gonna come back to everyone and see if they wanna make any final remarks. So the question is from a DPhil student in Oxford who's studying contributory versus redistributive systems and welfare attitudes. And the question is, would there be pers persuadable rationales for the public and taxpayers other than human humanity's subjective values or profits for redistributive social benefits rather than a contributory systems, especially given financial constraints? I thinking, referring here to Michael Sandel's the tyranny of merit arguments. Tim? Yeah, I'm not sure I have, I have a great answer, but let me let me flag up coming out of that question something we haven't really touched on, which is sort of pub, pub, the role of public attitudes in relation to the issues we've been debating. We kind of so so economists yeah. particularly guilty on just saying, well, we've got to take that stuff as given, and then we do the best we can do, um, given what people think are their obligations to others. Now, you can escape from that partly by ignoring politics and saying, well, I'm just going to advocate some morally correct position. Whether people like it or not, I'm just going to tell you what should happen. And economists often retreat there and then get very disappointed when politics doesn't do the things that they think <laughs> ought to be done according to that criterion. But the alternative, and, 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 and I think we, we need to think about this, we, we, do play time, we do spend a lot of time trying to shape uh, our attitudes um, to these issues. We, we, you know, those of us who brought up children will be fully aware we spend the, the first however many years of their life um, trying to uh, turn them into citizens with a sense of obligation, um, both private and social obligation, and that societies as a whole have a, a, a underneath a bedrock. And what we get out in the form of redistributive solutions or anything else is a reflection of the kinds of citizens that we we produce, um, and we do produce them, um, and it's tremendously important. Um, and, and you know whether they think long term, whether they feel a strong sense of connectedness and obligation to others less fortunate than themselves. All of these things are central and variable, um, and we should spend perhaps more time than we do be, um, thinking about how how we can build more. Um, a stronger bedrock or underlying set of values. Now, Michael's book on um, on the, the the tyranny of merit, in a way, is 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 a is about that theme. It's about how if we tell people that we live in a meritocratic society, then the people who do well out of that society yeah. believe they could did well because they're tremendously smart and not because they owe anything else uh, owe anything to anybody else. So you do by um, through, a, through the ideology of meritocracy, create a certain kind of society because of the nature, the, the attitudes and beliefs that that inculcates. So it's absolutely, you know, we, we don't want to become social engineers, and I don't think politicians would ever, maybe Greg disagrees, but would ever cast themselves as social engineers. But everything that we do, whether it be policy or, um, or, or the way we organize society, does have as a corollary a change in the way society perceives attitudes towards others. And we, we, we at least as social scientists have to realize that we're building, building that 
and, and that will then have a long-term impact on the kinds of societies that we that we create. Yep. Very good. Uh, yeah, and I can't help but feel that somewhere in this we need to think about pre-distribution policies and how those are part of reciprocity, particularly when you're talking about social mobility. So pre-distribution policies, which then give people those kind of opportunities for mobility and how much of that do we owe others? Um, I think it's, uh, we don't often talk about pre-distribution policies like education and things in a context of reciprocity so much, but anyway. Bigger question. Let me go back to each of you to make any kind of final remarks or thoughts about reciprocity over the life cycle that you wanted to do it in first order. So I'll start with you, uh, Greg, and then go to Tim and then Nick. Sorry, Tim and then Tanya and then Nick. Thank you, Manish. Uh, just quickly, um, something that, that Tim said at the outset of his paper, of course. Um, the challenge between the, the reality as we would probably see it, um, you know, from John Hills onwards of the life cycle and the fact that through the life cycle, most people benefit in one way or another, um, you know, from the welfare state broadly defined and that the politicians have to operate. And of course, the perception of, of people that they don't benefit through the life cycle, life cycle certainly at the top end. And I do think there's something around, I, I was wondering, as you have, a, not, not the top 1%, perhaps, although partly then, but that smaller group of extraordinarily wealthy people, actually, can one credibly um, persuade them that the state is important in any way to their, you know, to, to their existence through the life cycle? You know, the, the egregious example, I guess, is of the, the super billionaires, you know, buying up, buying up, uh, you know, Caribbean islands and the like, you know, to survive... Uh, you know, to survive a kind of um, global collapse. And I wonder where that takes you back, of course, to, to, to not, not equality uh, in a, necessarily in the broadest sense, but in that specific between everyone and that small, small group. And then I suppose finally, um, idealism. Yeah, it's, it's really struck by the, the, the focus on how do we get people to, to really buy in uh, in the round to the to the need for a for a social democratic state, and as I mentioned before, this was a perennial issue that that, that Labour and Liberal thinkers were taking on 120 years ago when uh, when the Labour movement was emerging. And at that stage, there was a very strong focus. Really, the strongest focus was on that you have to change people that that state structures um, won't achieve it. And I think where we sit now is. You know, the, the social democratic state has achieved a lot, but we have run into that challenge brought out very well in these papers of actually, you know, that, that further step towards, um, you know, an inclusive and comprehensive support for redistribution. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Tim? I'll just make one point, actually, it, and it came up in, in the last few questions and we didn't really tackle it, so it's odd to end on a point we haven't really discussed, but but it's sort of how we perceive um, future growth is, or, or whether we get future growth is tremendously important to how we resolve many of the challenges that we've been discussing. Um, you know, some people's view is we're going to transition to a society where for a variety of reasons, um, children will on average be um, less well off than their parents. But we've we've essentially inhabited a world which has had the opposite property for mm. well for a few hundred years. Not everybody is better off than their parents. That's but on average, each each generation is better off than its parents. And resolving some of the challenges we've been talking about how, about the uh, how the how the increased size of the cake is used, particularly when when there are elements of intergenerational redistribution, is much easier in that world. And uh, you know, it might come in the form of saying is R bigger than G, but whatever way you choose to frame it, um, you know, whether, whether we think there's a kind of end, end to growth scenario, which some people believe may have a big bearing on how the issues that we've been discussing today ultimately, uh, ultimately play out. Yeah, good point, good point. Tanya. 
I'd like to try and end on an optimistic note if I can and in so doing try and link um, my paper uh, which was as you know looking at reciprocity within a family with some of the other discussion about reciprocity at the level of the state and people's relationships to one another as as fellow citizens so if we ask ourselves the question why do people uh, exhibit this mutual helping behavior in families across generations then clearly it's something to do with the way in which they identify with one another they feel that they're in it together they want to help they want to support one another they care for one another because they recognize one another um, as as members of the same clan um, and it should be possible and it has been possible at certain periods historically and in certain um, places to expand that kind of sense of identity with the other well beyond the family strictly defined. So, of course, there are many, many forces that work against that. There are many um, individualizing and atomizing um, social forces as well. But we've just been through a pandemic. We've just been, we are still in a pandemic. And the uh, realization of the way in which we are, in one sense, very much all in it together, should I think provide an opportunity for reinforcing that sense of collective identity and responsibility for one another and a realization of our interdependence on one another that should mean there is an opportunity for building that reciprocity beyond the family to a broader collective. Thank you for that. Nick? Um, Manoush, I'd like to come back to your point about pre-distribution, which is enormously important and we're doing some of it, but not thinking about it systematically enough. I mean, nursery education, I've already mentioned, is a hugely important part of pre-distribution and all the evidence shows that and we all know it and it hasn't happened on anything like the quantity or quality it should. Mm -hmm. um, you've got um, education and training and very importantly, retraining. And in the case of prime, nursery, primary and secondary, you're talking about pure pre-distribution. In the case of tertiary, how you divide it up between tax finance and student loans. It's a mixture of pre-distribution and consumption smoothing that merits more thoughtful discussion um, than it's had. Um, child benefit is an example of pre-distribution. And then you've got ideas like Julian Legrand's idea of a capital endowment at age 18. So there's a lot of ideas floating around. Uh, a lot of them are already put into practice, but they're not given, I, I, I agree with your implicit um, um, statement, they're not given as much emphasis as they should be. Mm -hmm. And I think just on a final thought on that, I think that issue of pre-distribution and reciprocity across generations is very complicated in aging societies when you don't know that future generations are gonna even be your grandchildren because you may not have grandchildren yes. uh, and they might well be an immigrant's grandchildren rather than your biological grandchildren. And I think that really, uh, complicates the intergenerational issues. And I think Tanya's point about widening the sense of coming from the same community or tribe or clan beyond the traditional biological one that we associate with the, with the family is an important part of building a political consensus for reciprocity across generations and over time. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. That was, a, that was a fantastic discussion. I highly commend the papers to everyone in the audience and the LSE Public Policy Journal, which you can find uh, on open access. Uh, so uh, do, do have a look at that if you'd like to pursue any of these ideas. Thank you to the speakers for both the papers and the conversation and the wonderful discussion. And thank you to the audience for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>